Scott Tijan's lab at Berkeley identified the first eukaryotic transcription factors, uh, TF3A and SP1 seen here, really are the first set of eukaryotic transcription factors. SP1 recognizes that GC-rich element, which is right upstream of the transcription start, and further upstream are the so-called AP series of factors that are also involved in recognizing the SP40 enhancer. And these, of course, are host factors. They're not encoded by the virus. They're actually encoded by the, the, the mammalian genome itself. And that, in turn, of course, presaged the explosion of studies on transcription factors, sequence-specific factors. And the, at, at the last count, I think we now have roughly about 1,600 uh, human transcription factors encoded by the human genome. And, and they, of course, regulate every gene in the cell, including uh, these master regulators and reprogramming factors, some of which you are very familiar with. For example, MyOD over here is the transcription factor that can switch a, a fibroblast uh, into the muscle lineage. And uh, the, mo the, the famous uh, four here, the FAB4, OCT4, SOX2, KLF4 and MYC are the four Yamanaka factors that can reprogram a fibroblast into a uh, pluripotent stem cell. And of course, there, there are all these other ones that are coming out of the woodwork now. This is all very well and good. We've got enhancers. We have transcription factors that recognize the sequences within the enhancers. Uh, but there's one uh, small problem, which is that the DNA is not accessible, and many of you know this because this is a hotbed of chromatin research at the NIH. But when the DNA is wrapped in these fundamental particles contained, uh, consisting of uh, eight histones, as shown in the celebrated crystal structure over here, four histone proteins, each a pair, giving you a histone octamer. The DNA is wrapped around the octamer. And when it is so wrapped, um, a lot of it is not, the, the information is not accessible. And you can see the major groove, and you can put your finger on, in the groove and read off about four or five base pairs. But then you run into the histones as you read into the part that's facing the histones. And so a, a lot of that information is lost. And some factor, many factors, in fact, uh, really have a poor uh, recognition of nucleosomal DNA, with a few exceptions. There are some factors that, in fact, uh, do quite well on nucleosomal DNA, and there are even some factors that prefer nucleosomes. But in, by and large, in general, many of them uh, would much rather have the DNA free. What uh, many years ago we found um, here uh, uh, was really that there was a at least a transient, if not a persistent, rearrangement of chromatin at promoters and enhancers that unravels the DNA and creates this, this stretch of DNA that shows up either as a DNA's hypersensitive site. This is the, the one at the heat shock promoter that Michael mentioned, um, shown by uh, uh, the, the sort of the old-fashioned southern blot followed by restriction enzyme cleavage and then these are the cleavages that are induced by DNAs1. It's a fuzzy band, which gives you a sense of this, the, the stretch, the, the width, the breadth of the uh, target that's accessible to cleavage by DNAs1. And here again, we've taken some artistic license and put together this three-dimensional-like structure. But the DNA, this DNA is, in fact, a real promoter. It's the RPL4A gene in yeast. Well, what creates this open chromatin? And this is really a, a sort of a universal aspect of, of uh, chromatin architecture. And we now know, many of you know, that um, it's the combination of, of transcription factors, the sequence-specific factors that uh, recognize DNA, that recruit uh, a whole family of uh, co-regulators, these so-called remodeling enzymes, two main classes, those that covalently modify the flexible histone tails, uh, histone modification enzymes. And the second class are the ones that um, use the energy of ATP hydrolysis to mobilize histones on the DNA and create uh, these nucleosome-free regions. Um, and in fact, 
if you add up all the proteins that comprise these classes and uh, other related classes of co-regulators, we're coming up to, again, roughly 1,000 or so proteins in the human genome. So we're talking roughly 10 to 15% of genetic information is simply devoted to regulating gene expression on a genome-wide basis. Um, so nowadays, uh, this is sort of a more contemporary view of uh, mapping nucleosomes on DNA. Um, a, a technique known as MNA-seq, in which one uses an enzyme, micrococcal nuclease, which is a classical enzyme used in the field that chops up DNA between nucleosomes. Um, and instead of uh, doing uh, southern blotting, one would basically sequence everything that is resistant to MNA's cleavage and then map it back to the, the genome itself. And then, because we're always working with populations of cells, this case, this basically shows you what the arrangement would look like for a cell population in one gene. So if, in fact, the nucleosome was extremely well positioned, as it is, this one is, near the transcription start, then every cell would generate a DNA fragment of this size, located like so, at, at, at this position here. Um, if uh, the, some of the cells had nucleosomes right next to it, but other cells had it blank, well, then the, the number of the abundance of um, resistant fragments would drop, and you would see that in the MNA-seq signal. And if the, down over here, towards the end of the gene, where things seem to be getting scrambled, um, each cell would give you a different pattern. And if you would then add them all up, you would end up getting, things would start looking very scrambled, okay? If you can take all that data, and in, in this case, we've taken data that came from David Clark and Bruce Howard's labs. It's a paper they published in 2011. This is for the yeast genome, the budding yeast genome. Um, what you can see, we're looking at about 4,500 genes here, and each line represents one gene, and here's the transcription start site, and we've aligned all the genes according to the transcription start. Um, and what you will see as you go down, and these have been arranged by Peter Fitzgerald, our collaborator, um, in a way such that uh, some genes have a zero nucleosome-free region, the DNA's hypersensitive site, and others have very long ones. This one is roughly 300 base pairs. And as you look through the set of genes, you can arrange them in order of, the in, of increasing lengths of the nucleosome-free region, and this is what you see. And what's quite striking is that in the case of budding yeast, um, there's this big gap that is basically uh, seen throughout the genome, with the exception of a f small group of genes up here, which have no, no gap. These are the ones that are actually not, are uh, inducible genes, and in fact, it requires signaling to turn the genes on and to create a nucleosome-free region. And you can see a very nice first nucleosome, plus one, plus two, plus three, and as you keep going down towards the end of the gene, things as start getting scrambled. Well, it turns out that this kind of architecture is a universal one, not only among eukaryotes, but in, even in archaea. So here's a summary of all the data sets that came from uh, two labs, a Pew lab and a Denislo lab. And we're looking at now, uh, this is uh, the fission yeast, showing again the alignment is to the a transcription start site, and here's the plus one nucleosome, and then right upstream of that is this gap, this valley here. Here's cerevisiae, okay, so this one looks very nice, but here's the worm, and again, there's a drop here. Here's the fruit fly, human, um, slime moles, Arabidopsis, which is a little pepper plant, and even um, archaea, this is a organism that lives in hot springs, and they have archaeal histones, histone-like proteins. But even their start sites, right upstream, have a region which is free of the archaeal histones. So this seems to be really a universal architecture of chromatin um, in, in many, many organisms. So there's one ad additional aspect of this universal architecture, which, uh, uh, which is really the subject of my talk today, and that is a, a histone variant called H2A.Z. And that's also found uh, at the 
so-called plus one nucleosome, along with a lot of modifications such as acetylation and methylation of the histone tails. So what is histone H2A.Z? Um, it is a variant histone that I'll tell you a little bit more about, but um, it, uh, it is located, as I mentioned here, at the plus one nucleosome, a little bit at the minus one. The structure of the H2AZ nucleosome, which I think you can barely see in the light, is um, very much like the canonical one, and there are just some very subtle differences in the overall shape. However, as you will see, that there are certain amino acids which matter a lot, and those are the ones which make a difference, make a functional difference in conferring novel properties to this nucleosome. If you were to look at the distribution of H2AZ by MNA-seq, uh, as Frank Pugh did, this is his data set, this is what you see, that there is in fact an enrichment of the H2AZ uh, at the plus one nucleosome downstream of the nucleosome-free region technologies were applied to the histones. And because H2AZ was a unique gene, one could knock it out. And that's when things completely changed. It turns out that this is a very important histone. It's functionally required. It is conserved from yeast to human. And if you knock it out, uh, in a metazoan, either a fly or a worm or a mammalian organism like mouse, you basically don't survive, and, the, and the, the, the time of death is generally early in development. And, and then molecular studies, uh, by Mitch Smith lab especially, uh, discovered that this was in fact the histone H2AZ that was found at the promoters. And so this very minor fraction, this 4% or so, turns out to be the most important 4%, because that's where the, the action is at gene promoters and enhancers. And as Gary Felsenfeld showed here at the NIH, it's also at the insulators. And in fact, it's at every element where this, where every functional element in the genome in every organism. And that includes origins of replication as well. So this is really quite a signature. And so what does it do? Um, so it's been a quite a bit of work done in uh, biophysics as well as biochemistry. It affects the way the chromatin fiber falls. It affects the accessibility of the uh, factors in the vicinity of the H2AZ uh, nucleosome. It affects nucleosome dynamics. That nucleosome, that plus one nucleosome, is particularly, quote unquote, hot in the sense that it just gets exchanged a lot, much more than the rest of the nucleosomes along the gene. And uh, there's other biochemistry that shows that it affects the kinetics of transcription and even non-coding transcription as, as well as was found by Shiv Grewal's lab here at the NCI. So let me then just try to wrap up. Gene regulation in eukaryotes um, from the textbook models that we studied um, when I was in graduate school with the Jacob Bonneau, the famous Jacob Bonneau papers of, of activators and repressors binding to certain targets, yes, that does operate also in eukaryotes. And there's a lot more of those factors, as I mentioned, um, um, in mammalian genomes. But there's a whole layer that's put on top of that, which matters a lot and which plays a uh, intrinsically important role in regulating genes. Um, the, the, the enzymes that use ATP to mobilize histones the enzymes that put in chemical signals onto the histone tails, the variants of the histones that Bill Bonner discovered here, the chaperones of the histones. I didn't even have time to get into the chaperones with the exception of the cheese one that I mentioned briefly. Um, the whole realm of non-histone architectural proteins, such as cohesins, condensins, HMG proteins, also are important for eukaryotic gene regulation. Signals on the DNA, DNA methylation, I'm sure you all know, demethylation, the enzymes that are involved in those processes play an important role for, for many metazoans, but not all, it, they're not found in yeast or, or drosophila, but still very important. And then lastly, uh, the whole RNAi machinery that in, for many organisms is brought down to the chromatin to help in regulating its activities. So it's a lot more complicated, 
but I think, you know, um, you know, mammalian metazoans are more complex than, than bacteria, so not too surprising. But it does say that, that when we look back and think about transcription factors and the ones that are now very uh, fashionable, um, that, that in order for them to work properly, it's very important to understand the chromatin context under which they operate. And again, all those uh, principles that are laid out in the previous slide show up again here in a very recent review by Hochlidinger. So um, 